see I'm already dead. So how can you kill me? I've already given everything. It's not about me. It's not about you. See, I'm so free from me that I'm free from you. Because you don't determine my day. <clears throat> no matter how you treat me, doesn't matter. Because I will hurt for you and not be hurt by you. I will love you regardless of what you say, of what you do. See, I've been, I, I live in the fire. So the fire's not the issue. It's who's in there with you. Why is the fire the issue? The boys were in the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Rakshak and Benny, if you watch Veggie Tales. <laughs> <clears throat> they were in the fire, man. Didn't matter. Daniel was really in the lion's den. Really, he was really there. He was really there. He didn't get eaten, and those boys didn't burn. But if it's about you, you will get eaten, and you will get burnt. What does it mean to really give up? What does it mean to really surrender? That means it's not about you. It's all about him. And when you're about him, he's all about you. What does it look like in life? I love what Ben was sharing last night. <clears throat> I love it, man. I said to Ben, I said, you know what's amazing? I said, is you're preaching out of your life lived. You're preaching out of who you are because of what's been done through you and what God's done through in your life, in the workplace, it, wherever. Man, it's like, it's like David <clears throat> was an amazing, mighty warrior, man. David, amazing man of God, man. A man after God's heart. He did some horrible stuff, but he was a man after God's heart, right? But David was like going to be, he was going to be anointed king, <clears throat> right? And Saul came to like kill him, wanted him dead. He wanted him dead. He tried to kill him. He came into a cave and he's looking for David. David's in the cave, cuts a piece of his robe. And he says, I could have had you, the Lord. I could have had you. But how could I? Oh my gosh, man. Dude, David killed the lion and the bear in the secret place in his life when no one was looking. Who are you when no one's looking? Who are you? Are you just, it's not about ministry, man. It's about your life. It's not about, I'm going to talk to you about faith because I don't know anything else. My whole life is a faith walk. It's a faith, it's faith, man. But it's not faith in me. It's faith in him. It's important that no matter where we are in life, I was just talking to a gentleman this morning. I was just, Ben was talking about the leaven that we can leaven our city, right? And, and God spoke to me about leaven you know, he's been always speaking to me about it, about that. Because a woman, she hid, you know, she put a measure and it leavened the whole lump. Three measures, you know, and it leavened. <clears throat> and God spoke to me about everybody where you're planted, no matter where you are, in your school, in your workplace. You leaven the whole lump by your life lived in the midst of adversity. Oh, it's so powerful because it, it's not about, look, it, it's not about being in a full-time ministry position. It's about slaying the lion and the bear everywhere you are in every part of life. Stop. Don't press to get into full-time ministry. Be full-time Jesus, man. Your job, your workplace, your school is your mission field. It's not about trying to get up here and preach from a pulpit. You don't need a pulpit. Your life is a pulpit. I'm a heart protector, man. I just want to protect the hearts, but it's about life change, man. It's about, are you faithful in what you do and where you are and where you are in life? Everything you are, everything you are in, in high school, in, in college, in, in your workplace. Do people know about your Jesus by the way you rep his name? Do they see Christ in your life? 
or they see just another face, man. I love Ben or uh, uh, Phil's video. I was like up there. I was like crying. I'm like, oh, come on. It's not okay to be normal. It's not okay to be just so-so. It's not okay to just go to church, man. It's not okay. You should go to church. But a lot of people, they come to church because they've been hurt by the world. So they come to church to be loved. So I come to, if, if I'm in that place, I come to a building to see if they'll love me. And it's twisted. You don't come to church to get loved. You come to church because you've become love. Or you'll go from church to church, from body to body, looking to find if these people really love. Are these, are these people really Christians? Well, nope, no, they wouldn't love me. So they go, they don't appreciate me. And then God forbid you want to press to get into ministry. Because you have a need to be recognized, a need to be loved. You better understand that you've already been accepted by God. And you don't need the acceptance of others to be okay. Because it's impossible for you to reject me. I cannot be rejected by you. You can try, but I'm not approaching you for me. I don't come up to people for me. I come up to people from him. I live from him. I live in him. I abide in him. Come on, man. I'm passionate. Ben and I were talking about it this morning because Ben's like, he's like, look, he's even keel, dude. That's just Ben. That's how he's wired. I'm wired different. I'm explosive. I've always been explosive, but I was explosive for the devil my whole life, and I exploded, and I hurt, and I crushed people, and I, I just destroyed lives. When you come into the kingdom, you don't do what you feel like doing anymore. Before you come in, you only did what you felt like doing. You don't live by feelings in the kingdom. You live by faith. You walk and you live in faith. You don't live by how you feel. Or you will live and be pottered by the way that seems right to a man. Well, it feels good, I'll do it. Man, that got you in trouble. You don't do what feels good. You do what God says. Through Holy Spirit, thump in your heart every day. Boom! You wake up every day, God, I thank you. Even if it's just a couple of minutes, man, where you can just spend and say, God, today I want to be more like you. I'm not seeking you, God, because I want to do miracles. I'm not seeking you because I want to prophesy. I'm not seeking you because I want to cast out devils. I'm seeking you so that I could become like you. Because prophecy happens. It's a byproduct of sonship. But without being a son and understanding you're a daughter, you're a son. You can do all the stuff. You can still heal the sick. You can still have faith to heal the sick but live in condemnation. Not okay. God wants to raise up a bride that would live their life and be so powerfully awesome in character that it's unprecedented. That the wisdom that you carry in your workplace is so rocking that the people around you are intimidated by you, fear you because of the Christ in you, and are scared to say things about you because of your life lived. Not because... You're a Christian, a good confessing Christian, and a good scripture quoter. It's not about your quotation of scripture. If your life doesn't line up to it, it doesn't matter what you say you worship. The world has heard it, man. They've heard it. They haven't seen it, but they've heard it. Come on, man. In 2 Corinthians 3, it says this. It says, it's amazing, because it, it starts out and it talks about righteousness and condemnation. It talks about the ministry of Moses that he was given the ministry of condemnation, and it had glory. That's what it says. It had glory. And it was death written on stones. Condemn the ministry of condemnation. And, and, and then we've been given a different ministry. It's the ministry of righteousness, which has much more glory. Mucho. Mega. Amazing glory. That's what we've got. And then it goes down through, and it talks. It says Moses' base, you know, was bailed. You know, and, and, and that's where the ministry, he came down off the mountain after getting the law. And it was like glorious. And his face shined because he spent time in the presence of God and it was amazing. And the children were like, dude, cover your face. It's freaking us out, man. So he did. And then the glory faded. And he could take the veil off. And it was gone. It says, 
the Lord is the Spirit. I think it's in 2 Corinthians 3.17. Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, liberty. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Without a veil on, we're looking in the mirror. And we're seeing who we really are. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory, man. Looking in the mirror, Christ in you, the hope of glory, being transformed into what? Into the original image that God created us to be in the beginning. Man, redemption, the gospel is so much more, so much more than just getting to heaven. The gospel gets the hell out of you. For real. The gospel gets heaven into you and pushes the hell out of you so that you can actually be heaven on earth. The gospel is amazing. The gospel says, redemption says, that God has brought Todd back into the original image that he created me to be in the beginning as if I never ate the tree. That's how God sees me. So when I look in a mirror, that's what I see. I don't have a veil on. I look in the mirror and behold the glory of the Lord. Christ in me, the hope of glory. And I'm being transformed into what? Into the original image that God created me to be in the beginning. And I'm moving from glory to glory, not from bummer to bummer. I'm moving from glory to glory. From one place of glory to another. That means in your school, man. You move from glory to glory. You move from glory to glory in your school where everybody's against you and everything is against you and odds are against you and not as many people are Christians and lots of people are wicked and they're doing twisted stuff and on your job there are people that are making jokes about people and you're a Christian, you're a man of God so you don't laugh with them. Oh man, if that thing hits your heart and you're at work and people start making fun of people and you can't join in and you're so convicted of where your heart's at, you're so convicted that you couldn't laugh, that actually makes you cry, because you can't believe. Oh, I promise you, man, this is so possible and so amazing. See, I live this, man. I'm around people just like you. I'm not in some bubble. I am, but I'm not. I am in a God bubble, dude. Everywhere I go, it doesn't matter what people think. I'm me. God's created me in his image, and I realize who I am. I see who I am. And I hear the scripture, and I see it, and I do it. I hear it, and I do it. I read it, and I'm like, yes! And I do it. And if it doesn't work out, I do it again. And if it doesn't work out, I do it again. doesn't matter. Why? Because his word dominates my experience. It doesn't matter what I've been through or what I've gone through or what people have done or haven't done. That's not my potter. I'm pottered from the inside. The rule of God's government is set up his camp inside of me, and he likes it. And he works itself with, through my flesh, through my body, with fear and trembling. Salvation gets in and works itself through your members with fear and trembling. And starts to shake everything. Starts to potter everything inside where you're squeezed and molded by the Christ in you. And he molds you from the inside out. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, to offer your body, your whole life, as a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable before God. That means no parts out, all parts in. Every part of you is his. None of you is yours. Oh, this is really powerful, man. It'll change your life. Man. I was a drug addict my whole life. All I did was destroy people's lives every day. So all I did was manipulate and maneuver to get my way. And Jesus set me free from me. The gospel sets you free from you. So it's no longer about what everybody else is doing. It's no longer about what everybody else is thinking. It's no longer pointing the finger at other people saying they need this and they need that. It's about you becoming love and you becoming light. In such a way that everyone around you sees your life and they're so freaked out by you. That people, one by one, of family members come to Christ. One by one. Why? Not because of your good preach. Not because you share a good gospel. 
but because you live your life in such a way that the passion of your life is contagious. Come on, man. This is amazing. Where everyone around you gets wrecked by your life. Are you okay? Dude, this is about to get intense. It's already there. Because Christianity is a full contact sport. <laughs> really is. It's contagious, man. It is the fire of God. If I poured a gallon of gasoline on you and lit you on fire, would you really care about what other people thought? If I, I brought you up here, put gasoline on you and you could be as shy as you want. Are you really going to care at that point of what other people around you think? Guaranteed not. It's not going to matter. I'm looking foolish. It's not going to matter. You're burning. Let me ask you a question. What would it be like if on the day, on that day, the judgment day, the day, you know, we're not in a judgment day today. We're in a day of mercy. There will be a day. Today's not the day. So stop, stop pointing out. Stop. But there'll be a day. All judgment. What kind of judgment wasn't put on Jesus? Everything. <laughs> on Calvary, right? So we're in a day of mercy where Jesus was given the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciling people back to a father, not imputing the world's trespasses against them. And we've been given the same ministry. Does that mean pastors and elders and prophets and teachers? Yeah. But does that mean the whole body of Christ? Yeah. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. And how did Jesus reconcile people back to the father? Through his own strength, through his own words? Or did he do what he did through the father? Did he say that he could do nothing of himself and what he did, he saw the Father do, so what the Father did, the Son does in like manner, John 5, 19. Did he say that the words that I speak, I don't speak on my own authority, but it's the Father in me who does the works? Did he say, if you don't believe me through the things I say, at least believe me through the things I do, because it's the Father in me that's doing it? Did he say, or did he not? Or we just explain that stuff away and say, well, that was Jesus. Knock it off. Jesus modeled Christianity. As a man that was submitted to God, that was filled and possessed by God. See, Revelation 12, 11 is very powerful. It talks about overcoming the enemy. It says that you have overcome them, little children. Everybody understands the first part of the scripture. Not everybody gets to the last part. It says, you have overcome them by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of your testimony, and that you love not your own life unto death. You can't overcome the enemy by just the blood and by just the word of your testimony. Because selfishness will kill you. Selflessness is in righteousness. Selflessness is in the Father, is in the love of the Father. Jesus lived a selfless life. He laid it all down, man. And greater love hath no man than to lay down his own life. The greatest love of all is to lay it down. What does that mean? That means it's not about you. Come on, man. No joke. This thing's amazing. It's on. Oh, I promise. It's so good. I'm going to read to you. Thanks for keeping playing forever. Don't ever stop, man. It's awesome. It really helps. It's just amazing. Jesus. I was going to read a couple of sections of Scripture. You don't have to turn there. Just, I got it quicker. Whew. Philippians 3.10 says... That I might know him in the power of his resurrection. And, and we, we all want the power of his resurrection. But we don't like the next one. 
It's the fellowship of his sufferings. We're like, oh, no. I want the power of God, not the fellowship of his sufferings. <laughs> Easy on that. I'm ready for the power of God. Come on. I want the power. Luke 14, 26, 27 says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and his sisters, yes, even his own life, cannot be my disciple. Whew. That's heavy, man. God, hate, hate, this is about love. And you're telling me that if I don't hate my mother, my father, my sister, my brothers, my wife, even my own kids, that's heavy, man. Like, God, you're a God of love. Why would you want me to hate? God spoke to me. I'll never forget the time he spoke to me. He said, you know, Todd, it's not that you despise them. It's that if you don't love me most, you can't love them more. Just as Abraham was told, you're going to sacrifice your son. The promise. The one that the promise is coming through. The one that the promise is coming through. The millions of people. Millions. Look at the stars of the sky, Abraham. I'm going to bless through you. Through your son. Coming. I'm going to bless you through him. All the nations. It's going to cover everything. It's going to be awesome. Uh, Abraham, I need you to kill your boy. What? Okay, Lord. That's a heavy. Puts the wood on his son's back. Carry this wood up. The Lord will provide sacrifice. We don't have a sacrifice, Dad. The Lord will provide. You're the one he's providing. Come on, man. Think of the walk. Three days journey. You guys stay here. We'll be back. He's got to kill his boy. This is powerful. He, he travels up the mountain to get there on their journey. Whole way. Boy's carrying the wood. Strapped to his back. What was the conversation like on that walk? It was the last three days of his son's life. What was it like? What does it mean to deny yourself? What does it mean to hate? What does it mean to love less? What does it mean to deny yourself? Do you think that self tried to rise up in their, in their wall? I've never preached this before, so this is coming straight. What does it mean to walk three days with somebody that you know you've got to sacrifice? You know that the promise, the blessing, that everything is... I know that we've heard all kinds of stuff preached, but I'm sharing something that I'm hearing right now from God. I, I do better that way. Serious, man. Have no clue. Just go. So he gets to the top. It's like, let's make the altar. They make it out, man. Sacrifice. Offer your body as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable. Pleasing. I beg you, brethren, to offer your life as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable. Which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to the world. Don't be molded and shaped by the world and the way the world works and functions. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove the will of God. And that word is approve what the will of God is. So that you will know what the will of God is. So he builds the altar. Now son, I know this is going to be hard, but get on it. That boy was able to overpower Abraham. He was to the age where he would have had the strength to rock his dad. No joke. What does it mean to lay down your life? What does it mean? What kind of a person, what kind of a person would you have to be to be the one that crawled up on the altar knowing that you were the sacrifice? What kind of a person, what kind of a person would it take before Jesus? Dude, that's crazy that Abraham was going to strap his son down. Dad, what are you doing? God told me, you got to go, son. What was going through, what was going through his son's mind? What was going through, what was Isaac thinking? (sighs) 
probably thinking like Mary, let it be done according to your word. Come on, Abraham. Think of what was going through. He's going to kill his son that every blessing is coming through. Come on and think with me. Just join in with me and just think about what is going to happen here. Don't do it. Ugh. The son's like. Mm. What? There's a ram in the bush. There's your sacrifice. Come on, son. Help me get that ram. Oh, my gosh. Dude, think with me. What does it look like to hate your own life? What does it look like to love God with everything you are? What does it look like to love God with your whole life, with everything you are? With all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, with everything you are? What does it look like? What does it look like to full on surrender everything that you are, holding nothing back? Because God is really your provider. You know, we say Jehovah Jireh, it's it's the Lord your provider. I understand that. But I looked because I was just in Israel. And I looked up the definition because we were trying to get into the Dome of the Rock, which is illegal, unless you're Muslim. I looked at it, and it's the promise, you know. And it's, what what does Jehovah Jireh mean? You know, that part of the definition is the Lord will see to it. The Lord will see to it. He will see to it. So what does it look like to hate, to love not your own life unto death? Let me read another. You guys okay? Oh, it's so good. Jesus, come on. Mark 8, 34 through 38 says, when he called. Oh, yeah, after that, cannot be my disciple in verse 27 of the first one in Luke. says, whoever does not bear his cross, come after me, cannot be my disciple. Mark 8, 34 says, when he called his people to himself, his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. What will man give in exchange for his soul? Whoever is ashamed of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed. just all over this Matthew 16 Jesus said to his disciples if anyone desires to come after me let him him deny himself take up his cross and follow me whoever desires to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it what profit is a man to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul What will a man give in exchange for his soul? The Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father and his angels and reward each one according to his works. Luke 9, 23. He said to them all, if anyone denies, desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and does and himself is destroyed or lost. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and in his Father's glory and all of his holy angels. It's everywhere, guys. It's the same thing. Philippians 1. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always. So now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But I live on in the flesh. It means fruit from my labor. 
Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. For I am pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in my flesh is more needful for you. Being confident in this, knowing that I shall remain and continue with you for all your progress and joy of faith. He says, to live is tr- Christ and to die is gain. <laughs> See, Paul, Paul had this understanding, man. That he needed to lay everything that he was down on that altar, man. I just give up and surrender everything to God. Everything that he was. Because you can't hold on to you. You've got to just let him have you. You won't make it. You'll be crushed. You'll be destroyed. There's no way for you to make it holding on to you. Any part of you. There's no way. You can't make it. It's surrender or not. It's in or out. It's gather or scatter. It's for or against. There is no in between. None. You know, in my life, I, you know, as a drug addict, my, all I did was hurt people, man. And uh, it just destroyed, man. Destroyed everyone. You know, and I've been through a lot with, you know, my family. Like, like I went to Teen Challenge, you know, and, and I come out and I left the program 10 months early. I quit in everybody's eyes because all I did was I was a quitter. So, like, what you have to do when you position yourself that you're going after God is you have to never allow what people don't see to influence what you do see. You have to position your heart in such a way where it's full on surrender, where, where you've given everything you are to God, and you are a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice means that when it gets hot, you don't pull yourself off of that altar. The trial is okay. You can deal with it. You can handle it. God never allows you to be thumped on more than you can bear. And even though it seems like we can't bear it, the only reason we can't bear it is because you're still alive. Because the first part of the gospel is full on surrender, and any part of you that you hold back, that's the part that Satan loves to toy with, and stomp on, and mess with, and destroy. And then all of a sudden, you find yourself in this, in this place where you can't handle it, and you're praying for Jesus' return, because you can't handle life, man. Because your family is this and your people are this and your work is this and nobody appreciates you and nobody sees your value. Not realizing that you've already received your value from God. Where God says that you are accepted in the beloved and it's impossible to be rejected. It's a full on thing. You either surrender or you don't. The process is getting you to surrender. Because when you give up, when you submit to God, the devil's already resisted. You have no strength to resist the devil. Think what you want. You can't. He will thump you and destroy you. And make it all about you and destroy you every day through everyone that's around you. And you will be manipulated and pottered by experience and your surroundings. And people become your barometer of whether God loves you or not. If whether people treat you right or not. It's not about how you're treated. It's about the sufferings of God. It's about living for something other than yourself. Humility is choosing someone else. So I come out of Teen Challenge. And they come to my wedding. Because we got married... You know, I couldn't live with my wife, cause, or my, my girlfriend, because I, 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 my heart was changed. We lived together for nine years. My testimony is on Sid Roth. You can watch it. I, I can't share it all right now, but it's powerful. And we, I leave ten months early because of an encounter I have with Jesus. And everybody doubts me. There's only two people on the earth. Three. My daughter, my girlfriend, and Pastor Dan. Three people that believe that this is real. And everybody else. Everyone is against me but it doesn't matter because God is for me (sighs) not everybody's gonna understand your change people have heard the talk they haven't seen the walk lots of people confess my family man hardcore on my wedding day we invited them you guys can come if you want we're getting married we're gonna get married Sunday morning you gotta plan a wedding what do you mean you're gonna get married you got to plan this, you guys. Weddings are something to be planned. So, no, you guys don't understand this. this. is a covenant. What do you mean covenant? This is a wedding. This is a life. 
You are going to live. This is going to be for, for life. It's a, it's a shame that it really is for life. There's more divorce in the church than there is in the world. I don't care what your excuse is. How many times did you commit adultery on God? Did he divorce you? It's all about us, man. That needs so crushed out of us. I'm not being mean. I'm just going to preach it straight. I understand that lots of you are going through stuff. That has nothing to do with me preaching the truth. You let it cut you like a sword so that it changes the way you think. And you'll stop being the victim. We counsel people. We say, oh, you deserve better. Shame on you for saying that. Because you don't deserve better. You deserve hell. Come on, man. People counsel. Oh, honey, he should. Oh, you deserve better. He shouldn't have done that to you. Oh, I can't believe. Are you serious? Really? He did that to you? Oh, that's grounds for divorce. You should just. Making her the victim. Instead of teaching her and sharing with her that she needs to pray, not because she's been hurt, but because she's hurting for him. What are we doing? Who do we really serve? Do we serve our emotions? Do we serve our feelings? Or do we really serve him? Come on, man. This is touchy-feely stuff. You start touching on this stuff, and it's like, oh, yeah, well, you don't know what I've been through. No, you don't know what he went through. You say what you want. It doesn't, it doesn't. I, will, I want to preach the truth, man, because I'm tired of seeing a bride that doesn't know who she is. We can actually walk in the power of God, faith, faith that we're free from us. It's where our life is radical. So, <laughs> my wedding day. My, my wife's mom's there crying. My, my, wife's, my wife's stepdad is there. Angry man. Her mom's angry man. My family's angry. Everybody's angry. I destroyed their life. I hurt everybody. Her mom comes up to me after the wedding. And I said, I just want to thank you for coming. I can't believe she married you. I said, Mom, you'll see. You'll see. Oh, please don't tell me about this Jesus. Not Christians. None of them. Stepdad, you're a loser and you'll always be one. You don't fool me. At my wedding. You know what I said? You'll see. I love you. Get the blank away from me. That's what he said at church. I said, oh, I love you, man. You'll see. Went down the line. Thanks for coming. Can't believe she married you. Oh, I love you, man. Bless you. So nice for you guys to be here. Thanks for celebrating this day with us. You don't understand. See, we didn't plan. We did it in between services. First and second service. <laughs> the whole church is against me. My church that I went to. Because they all know the drugs. They all know the horrible stuff. They all know. Because for the five and a half months before, I went... Horrible addiction, man. I mean, I hurt everyone. I destroyed everyone's life, man. I manipulated, I maneuvered, I asked for money, for drugs, I asked for, I stole from everyone in my family. Everyone. And here's my wife. Was an atheist when I went to Teen Challenge. And was a Christian in two months when I came out. I destroyed her life for nine years. All I did was hurt. She knew that she was looking at a brand new man. God supernaturally redeemed it. She told her mom, Mom, you don't understand. He's a different man. One that I've never seen before. My daughter, I got a brand new dad. All I did, all my daughter heard was you're a loser, a liar, a thief. Uh, you can't hold a job. You quit everything. You're just like your father. All that stuff. It's all she heard. My daughter is 14 now. I want to tell you something. Righteousness is so powerful. My daughter has zero memory of drug addiction. Zero memory of one, your dad's a loser, he's a liar, he's a thief. She doesn't remember one thing. See, we like to say, well, that, well, she's going to have to deal with it because she's just mental blocking it. You're wrong and the gospel's right. 
You can say what you want, man. The gospel is supernatural. Supernatural. He races. Rips it out. Because a life lived is so amazing that you can't even picture that in a life. That over a period of time, all of your family changes. Every one of them. Because I've watched it. <laughs> oh, I go to the family reunions, you know, and they're all like freaked out by my life, man. They're all persecuting me and saying the meanest of things. I just love them. Every time. Never once, never once have I responded to my family in evil or wickedness. Not one time to any of them, not ever. <laughs> and it speaks so loud because they don't know why you're not rattled by anything and their, their lives are so freaked out by your very existence that one by one they bow <laughs> or I could look at them and say you're going to be on my team no I'm not you're a freak yes I am <laughs> oh what is faith what is faith the substance the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things that you don't yet see. God spoke and it was. It's time that we rise up and be a declaring bride. One that believes that she is who God says she is. One that believes she's blameless. One that believes she's spotless. One that believes that she can destroy hell for a living. That our destination is not... Our mission is destroying hell. Our destination is to get to heaven. But our destination should not be confused with our mission. Because we should live as according to the Lord's model prayer. That your will be done on this earth the same as it is in heaven. That we would look like it's heaven on earth everywhere we go. Regardless of our circumstance, regardless of the world around us. That it does not matter what's around us. Jesus said, I want to give you peace, guys. All of you who are heavy laden and burdened and weighed down. Come to me and I will give you peace. All of you. Come to me and I'll give you peace. My burden is light and my yoke is easy. You are yoked like oxen, yoked together, treading grain. You're yoked to Jesus and it's easy. And you tread the devil. Listen, man. This thing is a call to war. It's a call to the reality of who we really are. It's a call to who we really are. It doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter what your family thinks. It doesn't matter what your job thinks, what your employers think, what your school thinks. It doesn't matter what the superintendent thinks of your school. Why? Jesus is bigger than all that stuff. It's okay. It's okay if the baby cries. It's all right. You guys are okay. Don't be distracted. It'll stop. Jesus is amazing, guys. So my family was so intimidated by my life, so freaked out by me, so freaked out. But I want to share something, because when you walk in front of people, they're looking at you and wondering, and this is going to grip your heart, man, and we're going to pray, because it's very important that you understand what life you're living and where you are right now. Conviction is good. Holy Spirit brings conviction. He convicts the heart in a place where we're like, I'm tired of living this way. I really want this. I really want this. God is like making decisions in people's hearts about God really wanting this, about you really wanting what God wants. And God wants you to influence your family, wants to influence your culture, wants to influence your school, wants to influence like everyone around you to where your family reunions aren't a bummer anymore, where they're powerful in God, where you're not influenced by what your family thinks or what your family says. It's the power of God. Why are we not ashamed of this gospel? It says it in Romans 1.16. Pay attention. Romans 1.16 says this. For I am not ashamed of this gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for them that believe. First for the Jew and then for the Greek. Romans 1, 8, 1, 17. For in it, in what? In the gospel. 
the righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God. Since I have tonight, I'm probably going to go into righteousness and probably going to pound it, man. Pound redemption, pound righteousness, pound the finished work. I've had some people tell me, uh, actually all over the place, Todd, not everybody believes like you believe. And I said, that's a shame. Because all it is is believing what God says about me. Well, not everybody believes that, Todd. I actually had a minister get so angry at me, so mad, because one of her people she's been dealing with for three years, four years, three and a half years, was told that she went home and got, she was free after a night she came, and her pastor came with her. And she's totally free. I tried to tell my pastor about what you shared last night. I am so free. I wanted her to understand why I'm free. She goes, and I told her it's about righteousness. It's about the finished work. It's the finished. It's finished. She goes, I'm so thankful I'm free. Pastor jumps in, gets in front of her. She goes, yeah, I wasn't here last night. Have you ever heard of this and this? And she started to talk to me about these programs and these ministry things. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever heard of this, this well-known church, she said. I said, yeah, of course, I'm friends with people there. She goes, well, not everybody believes the way you believe, Todd. Angry. I said, what do you mean? Not everybody believes that it's that simple, that it's just that easy. I said, whoa. I said, you're telling me that we don't need faith, that we need your program to be free? That's sin. <sighs> oh, I confront that stuff because it's the devil. It's not your program. It's Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's demonic. That means that people need you in order to be free. What is that? You're not Jesus, dude. He's Jesus. As a counselor, you don't counsel people to depend on you in order to be free. You bring them to relationship with the Holy Spirit because they cannot depend on you. And you're actually getting your, getting your strength from what people think about you. Oh, it's so, so manipulative. It's so destroying of people. It's so the leaven of the Pharisees. Three leavens. Pharisees, Herod, kingdom. And I said, all I did was preach the finished work of the cross. You know, Paul said, I wouldn't dare boast in anything. Except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he knew everything. He was really smart. Brilliant. He said, I count it all as dung. Poop. For the sake of knowing him. Oh, dude. This is really important. I am very, very concerned. Because there are a lot of things out there. That are outside of the finished work. Trying to get people to a place of freedom. When it's the cross that it is finished. It is the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified that frees people from themselves. When they find out that everything against them was tacked on a tree. That the handwriting of requirements was wiped out. That he made a public spectacle of the devil. A laughing stock of the principalities. Publicly on a tree. And you realize what the tree really did. You will be free. Because freedom is in the cross. Freedom. Is in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Come on. He was crucified because of our offenses. The first punch, wham! Second punch, raised for our justification. Bam! Second punch, one-two punch that knocked the devil down.